Hey, well, let's get started. Welcome, everybody. I'm Minor Sinclair. I'm the executive director of the Center for Progressive Reform. And I'm thrilled to uh, welcome you all to this uh, book webinar about really one of the uh, groundbreaking books that is changing the conversation around climate and climate resili resilience. Uh, and but before we start, let me uh, go with you a few housekeeping details. Uh, as you can see here, so if you have problems with the webinar, you can uh, phone in for this number or, or, um, or attend obviously virtually. Uh, all participants will be muted during the webinar. And if you have questions, just type them into the question action box at the bottom of the screen and your, your questions will be visible to the moderator and to the presenters only. This webinar will be recorded and we'll share it with all the participants and all the RSVP registrants after, after this webinar. Uh, we do anticipate there will be members of the press uh, attending as well. The Center for Progressive Reform is a nonprofit research and advocacy organization. Uh, we harness the power of law and public policy to address the critical issues facing us uh, in these times climate justice, uh, the role of government in public regulations and public protections. Um, and for this, for this uh, session, I'm thrilled to, to welcome and introduce our moderator. Uh, our moderator is a nationally recognized expert in energy law, environmental law, and administrative law. Uh, they are the pro vice provost for Faculty Affairs and the Glenn Earl Western Research Professor of Law at the George Washington University Law School. So please to welcome Emily Hammond and turn it over to you, Emily. Thank you so much. And I um, have the honor of introducing um, Rob Burchick, who will be talking about his book today. Rob is a leading climate scholar and law professor at Loyola University in New Orleans. He's a senior fellow in disaster resilience at Tulane. He's a former appointee in the Obama administration. He's president of the Center for Progressive Reform. And uh, one thing you will not necessarily pick up um, from his bio, and perhaps it's only hinted at in the book, he's a talented blues harp player. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, let me just say, um, I'm Emily, I'm joining this call from uh, Piscataway and Anacostan People's Territory in what we call Washington, D.C. And Rob, I'm really delighted to have this conversation with you. Um, to get us started, um, let me just say, this is a book. Um, my own copy is already dog-eared to death, and I am planning already on um, what I'm going to be assigning from it to my students next semester. It's vividly written, it's compelling, it's also very practical. Um, it's about climate resilience. And so Rob, I wonder if you could just start by telling us about the book. Um, why did you write it and what's with that title? Well, I, I have to say, I, I just love showing this cover because the cover art uh, was amazing. And, I, and, I, and, uh, and of course it comes from this title, Octopus in the Parking Garage. So the thing for folks to know, is there really was an octopus in the parking garage. It really did happen back in 2016. Um, there was uh, uh, a man named Richard Conlon who lived in a sort of very nice uh, uh, condominium complex on Biscayne Bay in Miami. And he walked into his parking garage one day, a big structured unit, and there was this pool of fluorescent green water and a flopping octopus in it. And he took pictures and it made a meme of it. Uh, I got the meme from a friend who's, who teaches at Berkeley, and we were talking about that. And um, it turns out there was, it was a climate story. And the climate story was there was a, 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 a drainage pipe that went all the way down to Biscayne Bay. And because the water's been rising and the surge is a little different than it used to be, it reversed and spat this uh, cephalopod up on, onto the concrete. And... Um, and what I realized at that time is it, it's it's a climate story, and it's a, what I call an eight arm alarm bell about having to think about what might be happening as climate impacts occur. And if we can't keep an octopus out of a parking garage, what else can't we do essentially? And so uh, that that was the story, and I was really interested in pursuing this idea about how 
we should be preparing for climate change. I worked on that in the Obama administration during my time there, what it was preparing agencies for climate uh, resilience. And I also was really, really um, concerned, really committed to the idea of talking about it in a way that people could relate to and that wouldn't be scary. Um, there, I mean, this is life and death we're dealing with, and there are a lot of serious issues. But if you start out scared, I don't think you 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 learn as much and you get afraid of acting. And so I thought, well, rather than a polar bear or a melting ice cap or uh, a hurricane, we could talk about an octopus in the parking garage. And if we can start there, we can get to bigger to bigger issues. And so this is basically a book about how to prepare for climate change, even as we have to reduce carbon pollution um, in a second stage of this project. They should be working together. They're equally as important, but we have issues today that we are not going to be able to avoid and we need to learn how to manage just as we need to learn how to uh, um, avoid the, the things that we're not gonna be able to manage at all. So um, in reading the book, I'm, I'm going along, I'm totally hooked um, in, the inter in the introduction. And then you totally surprised me early on in the book by going back at least 6 million years to our <laughs> humanoid ancestors. And I wonder if you could share a little bit about um, your choice to include that chapter and, and what you wanted to convey and, and really teeing up the book um, with that historical exploration. Well, it's. It, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I was asked that just last night. I, I'm in uh, in the Bay Area right now, and I was at Kepler's uh, in Menlo Park, and and I was asked the same question. And so I was surprised we had to go back six million years, and um, it's it's about sort of toying with this idea uh, that the climate's always been changing, which is something you hear often when you get in conversations. It is absolutely true. Um, our climate has been fluctuating a long time, but in a in a much slower pace from from human standards, uh, and nothing as erratic as what as, as what we're seeing now, which is driven by human activity. But um, what I learned is that during the evolution of prehumans and humans, um, almost all of the evolutionary steps in which we attain what we think of as the hallmarks of human beings, they came as a result, most, most paleontologists think, came as a result of a response to climate fluctuation, which is to say that our species, among other things, evolved to adapt to changing climates. And if you look at the last million years, okay, which is a sliver of the life of humans and prehumans, that was a time when uh, the climate was fluctuating for natural reasons that we understand, but it was fluctuating wildly. And that is exactly the same time when uh, human brains began to enlarge and enlarge and get bigger and bigger. It's the time when we mastered tools, when we mastered cooking, when we mastered language and were able to uh, develop complex social networks uh, so that we could solve together problems that individuals in our species couldn't figure out, like how to deal with snow and frozen meat and, and you know, the, these kinds of things. So, so here's, here's the pitch that I want to make with that. Um, our big brains, which are a response to climate change, essentially, uh, our big brains are the key to solving this puzzle because we can't address climate change without sophisticated human social networks uh, in order to deal with it. And at the same time, our big brain is the cause of our problem because we have overexploited almost every resource on this planet exactly because we are so good <laughs> at, these, uh, at these socialized networks and using tools. And so we have to use our hallmark uh, tool uh, that is our big brains and our social networks in order in order to fix this. Um, the, the other thing that I found really, I, I just love this kind of stuff. I got the idea uh, from your city. I was, uh, when I was uh, in the Obama administration, one of the things I did on the weekends is I would go to the uh, National History Museum and there's the Hall of, of Human Origins, which you can go in there and it tells you this story, the story of human evolution as a response to climate change. Um, the one thing that, that we have to figure out 
we are not going to genetically evolve to accommodate this problem. We have to evolve in cultural ways, uh, which can happen much faster than genetic evolution, obviously. And, and it really is our, our invention of culture um, that allowed human beings to do many of the extraordinary things that they do, whether those are good things or, or whether they're, they're destructive things. Thanks so much. I, you know, speaking of culture and, and social networks, um, something else that I really appreciate about your book is the way it's infused with themes of justice and equity. Um, you attend to voices from um, communities that have been marginalized over time. And I wanted to explore that with you a bit because um, some people uh, would argue that anything about equity or justice should be secondary. Climate um, is, is such a fundamental threat to all of humanity that if we are to slow down our efforts um, fighting or preparing for climate change in order to also accommodate equity, um, that we'll lose too much time. Um, I think you take a different approach, and I wondered if you could talk about that. Yes, I, I can. So I came into this whole area of climate uh, law and climate resilience in 2005, I'm, I moved to New Orleans exactly nine months before Hurricane Katrina. And after that, my life changed, right? Along with so many others. Uh, you know, our house was flooded. We evacuated just like so many other, other people. And of course, front and center were these vulnerabilities uh, experienced by people on the basis of race, on the basis of income, on the basis of, of, uh, uh, of, other, uh, of other characteristics. And I moved my whole... Uh, sort of research agenda <laughs> since Hurricane Katrina. I said the rest of my career is going to be about climate resilience and disaster response. And I quickly learned, as you just pointed out, that so much of that is related to vulnerabilities in our own social systems. Um, what, uh, what geographers and people who study the social sciences of disaster will tell you is that there are really two kinds of drivers of risk. Uh, for a community. One are, is, is physical exposure, and that's are you near hurricanes, are you near wildfires, uh, you know, that sort of thing, droughts. Um, and then the other side is what sort of communities do you belong to? And are these communities robust socially and economically, uh, or are they uh, imperiled in some way? Um, and, and what we learn is that those two vulnerabilities, what we call social vulnerability is the term they use, uh, or, or geophysical vulnerability, they both are, are very large drivers. And in some places like New Orleans, the biggest driver is the social vulnerability. And so if the goal of addressing climate change is, is to reduce harm, whether it's to human beings or the biosphere or whatever it is, it, it, if the goal is to reduce the harm, you have to know both drivers at the same time. Uh, you have to address both. And sometimes it's cheaper to address the social vulnerability than it is the other. Um, so, so what I say, if, if and I, I get this asked all the time, it's like, well, we have this small window, we have to do something, there's only so much political uh, uh, um, uh, only so much political power we have, only so, so many political opportunities, economic opportunities. And what I, what I say is, well, if what your goal is, is to reduce suffering um, and to reduce the loss of assets of whatever, if that's the goal, you have to attend to both at the same time. You just can't say, I'm going to work on geophysical, but not work on on the social. And so that's what, for, for me, climate resilience, people ask what resilience means. In my context, it's it's bouncing back, of course, but not a, a community bouncing back, for instance, but it's not bouncing back the way it was. It's bouncing back better because we already have vulnerabilities in our communities, geophysical vulnerabilities and social vulnerabilities. And what I want are communities, if they're gonna thrive, which I think they can in many respects, they're going to have to bounce back both in terms of the geophysical and in terms of being more equal and uh, and having more economic and social opportunity, uh, because that's what's worth building back for. 
Thanks so much. And I should pause for just a minute. If people have questions um, as we're having this conversation, please go ahead and put them in the chat. We'll, um, we can accumulate them and, and come to them um, toward the end of the session. But I, I did want to make sure to welcome anyone's questions um, as we're talking or as they might occur to you. Um, so Rob, one of the things your book does um, very well, and actually let me back up. So the first, you might not know this, the first time we met, um, was um, when you gave a tour to environmental law professors of um, the the post Katrina world in, in I remember that. Yeah. 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 And you were such a good storyteller um, orally. And it's so fun to see that translated um, into the written word. Um, but but I do think that that your experience um, living there and being um, so much a part of the community there really shines through um in this book and it and it really sort of holds up a mirror right um to to the rest of the world um in the book you you do take us on a tour of of places and ecosystems and you talk about the the resilience challenges and opportunities in each of those places and i wondered if you could maybe first talk a bit about um how you chose what to focus on and then maybe um, tell us, take us on a deep dive into one of them. Well, you know, I have to say, um, it took a long time to figure out which of the places I was going to feature, because obviously there are too many, right? And and so I thought, the, the first thing I thought was I wanted to write about places and people, uh, particular uh, places in particular uh, that I already knew, that I cared about in some deep way because I'm convinced we have to care about these things before we're actually gonna uh, really spend our time and resources on it. So I'm from Las Vegas. I'm third generation Las Vegas, okay? So the one thing I knew was the Mojave Desert <laughs> and I knew Lake Mead, you know, which of course is connected to, to the uh, Colorado River and, um, and, and we're seeing issues of allocating water in the, in the Colorado right now. So I thought, okay, so I'm going to spend some time in Joshua Tree National Park uh, because I was interested in public lands. I thought public lands is, you know, a third of the country is owned by the U.S. government. We should talk about public lands. Um, I was in New Orleans and, you know, went through floods and so on. So I said, okay, so we're going we're gonna to talk about that. Um, and those both bring up, and obviously we have a, a coastal restoration project here in Louisiana, which is one of the most ambitious in the entire world. And both of those issues of landscapes, large landscapes, implicate ideas of how much human beings should be involved and how much they should stand aside and let nature take its course under the shadow of climate change. Um, I live uh, uh, in the summertime in, in Washington state. And so um, I thought it would be important to talk about the glaciers in, in uh, Mount Rainier National Park and uh, to talk about wildfires. Um, I have uh, friends, personal friends, who have been um, who have been wildfire fighters, uh, fighter wild, wild, firefighters in wildlands. Um, and so I, I wanted to pick up these various. Uh, places that I knew really well. I took up scuba diving a while back, and so I wanted to write about coral restoration and went to Florida for that, and met lots of really super interesting people along the way. Uh, you know, I write about uh, Sharon Levine, who is a, a retired special ed teacher down in uh, southern Louisiana, who is now an internationally recognized environmental justice advocate, uh, who is trying to make sure these chemical plants that are in her neighborhoods uh, are, are are not going to have accidents during storms, right? That are supercharged by climate. I talked to a a, a woman named uh, Cynthia Zermeno Moore, who who lives in Nevada, who lives in Las Vegas, um, who is right now this 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 month. I think she's she's lobbying for a bill in the state of Nevada to protect outdoor workers from heat stress. Which, if you can imagine, we don't have such a thing in Nevada, uh, even though we have triple degree you know, summers. Um, and uh, and I interviewed a, 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 a high school girl, 15 years old, who was a master diver and a peer review scientist doing work trying to restore coral reefs. So I, I, I look at, at all of these um, stories 
um, which are ways of showing people how how people can make a difference in their world at scale, incidentally. So just to give one one you know e e example, uh, I mentioned in Louisiana, we we have lost over the last hundred years, uh, we've lost uh, uh, two thousand square miles of contiguous wetlands. This is the largest wetlands in the lower 48. It's all in the state of Louisiana. Um, a quarter of all the seafood that people eat in the United States can trace its origins to those nourishing wetlands. There's a lot else that comes out of that too. And we're losing it all. And, and, and one, of, one of the factors is oil and gas industries have just essentially destroyed it uh, over, over time, you know, during since uh, oil was uh, was being explored there. And uh, and so now we're engaged in a project uh, funded by the federal government, funded by oil companies uh, who've been sued over it, uh, BP being one. Um, we are launching a $50 billion project to restore those wetlands by diverting fresh water from the Mississippi River, bringing sediment and fresh water into these destroyed areas and essentially building the land back. Um, every delta in the in the world has a similar kind of a problem. Uh, and if we can show how this works at scale, we will be an example for the entire rest of the world. Uh, the engineering, the science, we've got scientists from NASA, we've got policy people, you know, looking at this to make sure how do you how do you regulate all the uses on a coast? And um, I take my students every semester, we go paddling, uh, we go kayaking uh, through one of the major swamps that is going to be redeveloped because of this diversion. And we talk to fisher folks, some of whom like that idea, some of whom don't for short term reasons. Um, we look at uh, the hydrology, we look at the way that canals have actually destroyed some of the wetlands, we learn the biology and the ecology about that, because that's how you understand in a law school why permitting is important and what the permits have to require and these kinds of things. So that's just one example, and, and, you know, and we uh, uh, are lucky enough to, to hear from people like uh, uh, Chief Sherelle uh, uh, Parfait Dardar, who's the leader of the Grand Caillou Duloc uh, tribe in Southern Louisiana, one of the several indigenous groups that are losing their land at alarming rates. And um, I went to her house, which actually had been destroyed uh, part of it during Hurricane Ida. Uh, my wife and I went down there, we we met with her for a day and she told us all kinds of uh, of, of stories about this and and how you can do it in a local way. So their community, their indigenous community, um, has special ancestral sites that have been around for 1,500, 2,000 years. Uh, there, that was one of the most complex societies back then in all of North America, called the Poverty Point people, and. Uh, uh, and they want to preserve those ancestral sites. And so they, they're using their traditional knowledge to track which waterways uh, have been flooding um, it, to endanger those places. And they're trying to petition the Army Corps and others uh, to, with very small projects to protect uh, what are extremely valuable cultural land. And that would never happen if it weren't for groups um, like uh, the Grand Caillou Duloc, um, who, who has such a good understanding of the history of these areas and where to build and, and these kinds of things. So that's just one example um, that I try to, to take apart and show, look, it's, it's Army Corps of Engineers, it's NASA scientists, and then, and then it's also you know, indigenous folk who've been in that region for you know, 2000 years or so. Um, and we're all trying to learn not only how to share this space, but how to repair this this space and there's a role for everybody in that. Maybe I could pick up on that theme a little bit um, because one of the things I did really enjoy um, about the book is how um, how you do highlight um, so many individuals' voices and and you really um, I think show how any individual um, who's reading this book or, or or not right who is who is who cares about climate change and resilience can can actually act and, and make a contribution. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to read a quote. Um, 
you wrote about um, Wendy Gao, who was a 15 year old, um, actually near near me where I live um, in, in Northern Virginia. Um, and she, I, I take it, um, learned all about solar um, power financing so that she could um, ultimately get solar panels installed um, on top of her school. And her quote is this, and it just um, kind of gives me chills every time I read it and it's gonna happen again. Um, you wrote that she said, I realized my voice was more powerful than I had thought. And I wondered if you could delve into this a little bit. I, I, you chose to, to use that quote and I think it's, it's brilliant. And um, maybe tell us a little bit more about how you, how you pick up on that kind of theme throughout the book. Well, I was definitely interested in, in interviewing and learning from young people. And uh, Wendy is somebody actually that I first interviewed on on the podcast Connect the Dots, and and now she's graduating from University of Virginia, and she is uh, she's on fire, right? She's an international activist uh, on on climate change. Um, I, I, um, I'll give you a, a, a quick story that maybe illustrates a little bit of this, is because I try to understand sort of what the awakening is like, and um, I interviewed uh, uh, a. Uh, high school student um, who was also 15 at the time. Uh, her name was Karen Norman. And as I mentioned before, she was a master scuba diver and she's uh, working in an area of, coast, of a coral restoration with citizen scientists. She works with foundations in the Florida area, which is where she's from. And they transplant or replant, I should say, 30,000 corals a year. Uh, in these areas trying to rebuild reefs. Um, and I, I asked uh, I, I asked uh, Kara how she first got involved in scuba diving. You know, what, what was it? And she's like, well, she was interested in science vaguely and there was nothing that appealed to her in her schools. Uh, so she found an after school, an independent after school program that was teaching scuba diving to middle schoolers. And she was attracted because it was it was beautiful down there. And she liked, you know, the movies that, that, that show the undersea and the whole thing. And so that was going to be interesting. But th that lasted about five minutes. And then she got interested in like, why does the water behave this way? What are the coral reefs? How do these animals all live together? And and the after school group which was for middle schoolers, was mainly made up of middle school girls uh, who were interested in vaguely science, but were dissatisfied and not attracted to science in their schools. And so all of them start working on uh, projects guided by, by the instructors in this program. And uh, Kama Cannon being the one who formed this, uh, whom I also interview. And so Kara starts, uh, learning about coral, why it's failing, how restoration might help. Um, she gets involved in larger studies, as do her other uh, uh, scuba mates uh, doing this. And so, and I said, well, what do you want to do, you know, when you when you go on to college? She's like, I want to be a marine biologist. And, and most of the people, most of the girls in this program want to be my marine biologists. They didn't think they were scientists or that they wanted to be scientists. So now they're learning about this. And I said, well, um, tell me, I said, are you are you political at all? Uh, and she's like, no, I'm not political. And she goes, I don't vote. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I'm whatever. <laughs> and um, and so I was asking her sort of like what she does in her in her pastimes. Um, and she says, well, aside from scuba, I'm often talking at, at uh, public hearings. I'm I'm going to a protest after our interview. I'm like, what are you protesting? She's like, well, I I think that these uh, there are too many cruise ships coming around Key West, and that's harming uh, the 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 um, the wildlife. And I said, isn't that political? And she's like, no, that's not political. That's just science. I'm just telling them the facts. And I just love this. Here you have this girl who, when she was in middle school like the beauty of the undersea. And now she's a scientist. Uh, she's a political activist. Um, and she's, her whole world has expanded and she's developed a set of skills that's just amazing. And um, she's an extraordinary person, but I think lots of people are just waiting um, they're, they're bells and they're just waiting to be rung. That's uh, what a, a line from Annie Dillard. And I think that's just a great way of seeing it. 
That's such a great story on, on so many levels. And, um, you know, actually, somebody has put a Q&A that I might go ahead and, and, and sure. ask you because I think it, it relates to, to some of what you just said, which is um, this person appreciates the shout out to the local groups um, and wonders how does one go about finding local groups that will have the greatest collective impact? Um, and then the second part is um, what would be the best way to leverage the efforts of community put together with scientists and lawyers and policymakers? So two-part question. I think one of the best ways to go about it is this. I, so, so you might think, oh, well, what I need to do is find myself a climate resilience group to join, right? And, and, and I'm here to tell you that if you, if you, if you Google that, you're probably not going to find much, right? Um, but what you might do instead, right, is think about what is it that I really care about that I want to be involved in? Maybe that's children's health. Maybe it's scuba diving. Maybe it is, um, uh, uh, you know, desert landscapes, right? Uh, maybe you belong to the Sierra Club, like, like my mother for many years, you know, hiked with the Sierra Club in, in the deserts. Um, and then what you can say to yourself is how does, how, it, how are climate impacts, whether it's drought or peripatetic storms or increased precipitation or whatever it is, how is climate change going to make that thing harder, right? And then you could say, okay, whatever organization I'm in, maybe I'm in an organization where I, I, I hike in the desert, maybe I'm in an organization where I snorkel, maybe I'm in an organization um, maybe I'm a school teacher for young children and I'm interested in kids having time outdoors for recess, right? And then I can say to myself, okay, how is that going to be harder because it's going to be hotter or more polluted or whatever? And then whatever that organization is, we can start talking about climate change and pulling climate resilience into whatever you are already doing. Um, I actually think land use uh, and zoning it, it is a very big part of being more resilient, very local. And as you know, uh, that, that is probably one of the largest regulatory areas in the country uh, in terms of what people experience is land use issues and zoning. And it's, it's, it's very local. It's very accountable to at least the voices that show up at those meetings. And, um, and so you can start looking for ways to become active in things that you already care about. You know, when I was talking last night to a group, I said, you know, we, we're, I'm in California now. And I said, okay, so in California, uh, the, the damage to wildfire is expected to be 75% more by the end, end of the century. And, uh, and uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's the state of California predicts it might be eight degrees Fahrenheit hotter than it is today on average. In California. And I said, well, if you knew that, what would you say to a zoning board or a planning committee? You know, uh, Southern California might lose uh, two thirds of its beaches by 2100 if it doesn't change landscaping issues and so on. And I said, so what would you tell a, a city council about that? And I said, well, now you know that information. So now you can't not speak up, <laughs> yeah, you know, because there are a lot of a, a lot of things like that. So I think it's pulling in climate into the things you're already working on is is an easier way to do it. Thanks. Um, you mentioned uh, local areas and land use, and um, uh, one of your chapters is about climate migration. And I wonder mm. if you could talk a little bit about this this. I think there's a tension between, um, you know, should should people stay in these places that are very vulnerable? Um, uh, is it better to have people move? Um, is it better to build up resilience? Is it actually either or? Um, could you speak to that a little bit? It's a really hard question. I mean, when we when we adapt to climate change, we generally talk about either resisting something, which might mean a seawall, or adjusting something, which might mean elevating a home, for instance, or redoing your stormwater drainage system, um, or it retreat is the third, uh, which, which means either people who are existing somewhere leave, or uh, at the very least, you decide not to build in in places that are that are prone to problems. And um, 
and and we talk sometimes as if it's obvious which one of those we should choose. Um, and in in reality, it really has to do with how much money sometimes you have to spend and so on. So I mean, the folks in southern Manhattan are not going to retreat. They are planning to build a big U-shaped wall to protect Wall Street and the Battery. Uh, Houston is thinking about a wall too. Uh, we have uh, uh, the largest, uh, maybe most sophisticated levy system in in the world here, protect, uh, protecting us in New Orleans, or one of the most sophisticated. Um, on the other hand, uh, Chief Shirell uh, 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 is a leader of of, of of a community, much of which is not within the levy walls at all, and there, and so, hey, they don't have that option. Their option is probably to leave at at, at some point. Um, the uh, statistics tell us, uh, this is from the United, uh, from the U.S. agencies, tell us that about 12 million people will probably be migrating from the coast in, inland into the United, in other cities in the United States. Um, we did some research at, at Center for Progressive Reform a few years back where we identified, I think it was 12 communities that were actively seeking to relocate in total. Every one of them was an indigenous community, uh, most of them in Alaska, Washington State, and then there's one in Louisiana. Um, so it, it, uh, so here's what I here, here's I guess what I think about the retreat issue. It's inevitable that some places are going to see retreat. If you count retreat as people leaving one at a time, that's already happening. Uh, you know, there are people already leaving southern Louisiana for sure. There are people we know from real estate markets already move, moving from parts of Florida. Um, and, and it's not just climate change, but it's that plus other kinds of issues. So that's happening. Um, I, I think what we, to make it fair, okay, what we need to do is give notice to communities. Uh, the governments need to give notice to communities about what the government is prepared to protect and what it's not. Uh, what the future holds. I think it's up to the federal government and to state governments to make money available to help people move and sometimes create incentives for people to move as communities. Um, that's going to mean talking with the communities that are probably going to be accepting these this influx of people. Uh, people who leave Miami, a lot of them go to Orlando. Uh, a lot of people uh, who are going to be leaving New Orleans will go to uh, Baton Rouge uh, or or to Houston, which is not as safe, but that's something. A lot of people are moving to Las Vegas from Southern California in part because of their concerns about real estate uh, value and insurance. And um, But there are no conversations among these communities. Las Vegas isn't talking to Los Angeles. Baton Rouge isn't talking to New Orleans. Um, and that's just going to build up a lot of resentment and, you know, problems with jobs and schools and, and, and all the rest. So that kind of retreat is going to be happening. Uh, and, and, and if we get it, uh, in on it on the front end, I think it's a lot easier. And we have to be, to your point earlier about um, fairness and equality, what I really don't what I really am worried about is that the market just drives this, that poor people who can't afford their flood insurance anymore end up having to just leave their homes, not even being able to sell them and going somewhere else. Um, that That is a tragedy. It's already happening, that kind of thing. And so what we need are systems in place to anticipate and help people um, to make these transitions. Yeah, thanks. I, I found that to be a really... Um thought-provoking chapter. Mm -hmm. sure. yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, here's another question that's come in. Um, many of the populations um, in the United States that are most at risk of climate change um, impacts are um, in red, uh, rural communities who have developed a strong culture of distrust of government. And so the question uh, poses that premise and then asks, how can we reach out to these communities on the issue of climate resilience? Um, which by definition seems to involve a significant amount of government involvement. It, th this is one of the reasons I wrote the book was to address this, this issue. I think that climate resilience is an easier pathway to climate discussions uh, among uh, across political parties. 
And one of the reasons I think is that not only is the issue of climate vulnerability more concrete, I mean, your house might flood, right? Or your insurance goes up because you're near an area that's prone to wildfire. I, heard, I hear that a lot here around the San Francisco area, people talking about their insurance rates on fire. And um, so it gets people's attention in a concrete way, but it also appeals to a different set of values, right? So um, a lot of our communications research shows that uh, people who tend to dismiss climate evidence uh, do so not because they don't understand it, uh, but do it because they don't like uh, what it says about the nature of the solutions, you know, global cooperation, heavy federal regulation. Um, and they're just not going to, they don't want to explore problems that have answers like that. <laughs> um, but but because they, they suggest values that are that are maybe not their primary values. Um, but um, a lot of people in red states, a lot of people in Nevada where I grew up, right? They're very, you know, they they want to protect their families. They want to protect the value of their property. It's their job to uh, be smart about how they use money. Uh, you don't want the government to be building bridges that are going to flood in 10 years. That's dumb, right? Uh, and 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 so um, so you can appeal to people by saying, look, don't you want to be more secure, right? Don't you want to protect your family? And I found this when I was in the Obama administration doing traveling. I know as as, as you did in your in your roles. Uh, I remember going to Iowa. Uh, in in Des Moines, and we were having uh, we were having presentations uh, in some communities and some of the rural c uh, communities uh, outside as well, saying, "Well, we think it would be a good we at the EPA. We think it would be a good idea if you incorporated climate projections into these things and uh, into your uh, city planning, town planning." And of course, you know, they they didn't kind of, didn't take to that immediately. But we brought in local scientists who said, hey, I've been fishing these rivers forever. This is what I see. Um, this, is a, this is a town, a, a small rural town that's flooded three or four times in, in a span in which that's very unusual. Don't, don't you want, don't you, do you think that we could do something to fix this? And, and they always want to say yes, right? And they want money to do it and they want science to do it. Now, they might not want to admit at, that, at this point that climate is the driver, but everybody knows that the river's flooding more than it used to. And they want to fix that problem. Now, eventually, you're going to have to bring in climate science to make projections. That's what we're doing in the state of Louisiana. I mentioned this coastal restoration project we have. Every five years, uh, roughly, it is unanimously approved by a Republican state legislature. And that report is chock full of climate science. Uh, about the rivers, about the rain, about the sea level rise. Why? Because the federal government insisted on it. They said, if we're going to if we're going to give you money to work on this problem, you are not <laughs> going to to dismiss climate science. But you know what? Everybody's for it. Bobby Jindal was for it. Um, uh, every every Republican politician that I know is is for that. Now they don't always want to talk about climate change, but they're not dismissing it. And, and you know, uh, Governor DeSantis is doing exactly the same thing, um, putting millions and millions of dollars into climate resilience projects in Southern Florida based on climate science, and um, and everybody is willing to do that. And so I, 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 I think it's just a way of starting that. And over time, when you build trust, maybe you can talk about other things. Thanks. Um, maybe what you just said offers um, a, a, a beam of hope um, towards something that I think many of us on this call um, sometimes, sometimes encounter, which is climate despair, right? Mm -hmm. The idea that um, this is such an incredible problem. It's something we caused and it's cataclysmic. Um, what can we really do? Um, and I wondered if you would maybe reflect personally on how, how you keep going, what is your why um, to keep at it? And then if there's a different answer, what do you tell your students when they come to you yeah. with that, that same concern? Well, it, it, it is deadly serious what we're working on. And um, 
there are no easy answers to a lot of this. And, and most of the problems I think that, that, that need the solving are the political action problems and the collective action problems, right? Because a, a lot of the technology is there and, e and even accessible economically if we think hard enough about it. Um, I, I myself did a lot of self-reflection and a lot of reading. I, I have a whole bookshelf of books on hope actually. And, and, and they're not just, they're not inspirational necessarily. They're about, I mean, Re Rebecca Solnit is a, is a wonderful writer on hope and there are others too. Um, um, uh, and I make the, the distinction between optimism and hope. And I learned this distinction from uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, um, who, who said many times that he wasn't necessarily an optimist, but that he always was a hopeful person. And, and what he meant was you don't have to think it's likely that the right future will evolve. But as long as it's plausible that it could, it's your job to be an agent of change. And that's the hope part. Uh, a person who's hopeful doesn't know it's all going to go terribly and doesn't know that it's all going to turn out right. The person with hope is, is agnostic about that, uh, but knows that the difference between tragedy and um, success is, is what individual people decide to do. Uh, and can convince other people to do. <laughs> and so that's what I'm doing what I'm doing. I mean, that's the personal side of it. Uh, I, um, you know, I end the book actually with a hike that I take pretty regularly um, on Mount Rainier, uh, looking at glaciers that years ago I climbed um, when, when, when summiting Mount Rainier, this was years ago. Um, but I know those glaciers and, uh, and I see them at least once a year, you know, hiking. And they do change a lot. And uh, that's not good. And it's depressing sometimes to me. Um, but I know that, um, that there are plenty of things worth saving. And that if we can't learn to love scarred landscapes, um, then what's the point? I mean, you know, if, if we worry about things to be perfect before we'll love them and invest in them, I mean, you'd never you'd never enter a personal relationship if you thought that way. <laughs> right? There's always got to be give and take, and um, and and you're always after making something better than it was. And and I, what I tell my students, I say, you know what, climate change is not a pass fail test. Just because you can't get an A doesn't mean you have to settle for an F, right? Um, this talk about we're in the window where we, of action. Well, we are in a window of action, but if we can get a B or maybe a C plus, that's better than getting an F. And uh, if we can keep, you know, heating to two degrees rather than one and a half or from three degrees rather than two, I would rather have one and a half. Everybody would rather have one and a half, but I'm for keeping it down as low as, as we possibly can. And it's my job to help encourage people to do that. Thanks so much. Um, right there with you. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, oh, you have a, a nice comment um, uh, from somebody who's planning to buy your book. And um, I'll let you read that later. Um, but maybe this is a good segue. We're, we're starting to get close on time. I wanted to make sure anybody else who had a question would have a chance to type it into the, the Q&A box. And Meanwhile, Rob, um, could you tell us a little bit about your book tour, um, where people can find your book, and where you'll be next? Well, so I'm excited. I've never had a book tour before because uh, I've written books, but uh, but mainly not for not for lay audiences. And 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 one of the things, the feedback I'm getting from lay audiences and, and from friends who aren't experts is that they say they really feel my, they hear my voice, mm -hmm. uh, which which is the biggest compliment. I mean, like it or not. It sounds like me. It does. <laughs> and, it really does. And that's, uh, and so that's a huge compliment, and it's something that I'm I'm really happy with. And so, uh, I I was just last night at Kepler's Books uh, in uh, Menlo Park, uh, California. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to be talking with Andy Revkin on his video show called Sustain What. Um, that's at 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, I'll be back in New Orleans at Octavia Books on April 19th. Uh, the Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge uh, on April 21st, talking with a class, a law school classmate of mine, Alan Jenkins, 
who's on the faculty at the law school there. Um, I'll be in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, on April 28th at Lost City Books, and then in Miami uh, on May 10th, and New York, May 11th, and uh, Las Vegas. Uh, I'm going to give a shout out to the Writer's Block, one of the best bookstores I've ever been to, uh, May 18th, and then Elliott Bay Bookstore in um, Seattle on May 23rd, and then on Whidbey Island, where I uh, live during the summertime, I'll be giving a talk uh, sponsored by Moonraker Books um, at uh, on June 9th. Terrific. And do you have a website? If, if people didn't quite catch it, is there a place they can? Yeah, 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 there is. It? Yeah, robvercik.com. <laughs> Great. Great. <laughs> All one and word, robvercik. Uh, yeah. yeah, and for those um, on the call who follow CPR on various social media channels, I think CPR has also pushed out your your dates um or, or hopefully they will very soon um so um great well why don't we um wrap it up a little bit let me just say thank you so much um i was really looking forward to this conversation and um like i said i i, I really enjoyed the book um i expect to return to it over and over again and um really appreciate the work that you've done um you know and poured into this effort and are doing now. So um, let me just say thank you. Um, I think we'll turn it back over to Minor, who had just a few wrap ups. Thank you so much. And Emily, you know that I'm such an admirer of your work too, and and all of the things that you do. And uh, so, uh, I, so I just feel very, uh, very grateful and privileged to have an interview with you today. Thanks. That's great. And I want to thank you all for attending. Uh, Rob said early that, you know, we cannot address climate change without sophisticated social networks. And I suspect if we look at all the folks who joined this, uh, this book talk today, we're all involved in sophisticated social networks. So thank you for all you do. And please join us. We invite you to join us um, at the center, uh, www.progressivereform.org. Uh, thank you, Emily. Uh, you really guide us through this fascinating uh, climate journey, and we covered a lot of ground, and you, you you did it all within an hour. So, and Rob, particularly for such a thoughtful, inspiring, humorous, I guess, and a you book. <laughs> um, it it really, I think, it really changed the conversation and the narrative about climate in a way that that makes it much more hopeful and much more personal. Um, there's something in there for everybody. We'll be following up this uh, webinar with a recording. We'll send it out shortly and also a survey because we want to also hear your experience um, uh, from this. So thank you very much and look forward to talking with you soon.